Previously, we looked at the for loop in C++ and shown it as a counting loop. There are a few other things we do want to show that are a little bit more advanced. However, you still do run into them periodically. Let's first look at our integer variable of i. Now, this integer variable will only be available inside of our for loop. So while we can see it here inside of our for loop, so if I go to the outside the for loop and put our same CL statement that we had in before and try to run this, we will actually get an error. And that's because the variable i is not inside of our for loop. So one thing that we can do is we can specify our variable here outside of our for loop. In our for initialization section, we'll just remove the data type. So all we do is set the value. And now if I go and run this file, it will execute. And that is because our for loop has the variable i and is using that existing variable inside of the for loop. But because it was defined outside of the for loop, we can use it in other places, for example, after the for loop. And this interesting distinction becomes very powerful in our next example. So I'm going to undo these real quick. And I want to specify a nested loop. A nested loop is a loop inside of a loop. And this is used most often when we're using something like an array of strings, multidimensional arrays, etc. So let's take a look at how we would build a nested loop. Inside my loop, I would specify for, in this case, I'm going to create a variable called j. Now we have our variable j. Our inner loop is very similar to our outer loop, except for using j instead of i. We have a separate C out statement inside of it. We could do whatever we want logic wise. All of our logic could be inside that nested loop, for example. I just want to run this real quick just so you can kind of see what's going to happen. You notice that we print i, then we print all the j's, and go and print the next i, then all the j's, etc. Now, this seems to be fine and it ran very quickly, as you saw. However, there is a couple of things you need to be aware of. For example, any time that you define a variable, in this case, int j equals zero, that actually takes a bit of processing power to create the variable, declare it, set up memory space, etc. Because the variable is destroyed at the end of our for loop, every time we go and recreate this for loop, we have to recreate that variable. Since we're using the same variable, we could just create it one time, and that would be much faster. Now, in a small example like this, where you only have 100 instances, it's not that big a deal. But if we start looking at a very large data set, where we had tens of thousands of instances, for example, this could be quite problematic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove my data type. So now I'm no longer declaring my variable here. I'm just setting its value. Because i and j are the same data type, you can simply put a comma, and this is going to declare j as an integer, just like it declared i. We don't bother with setting a value because that will be done inside of the for initialization loop for our inner loop. If we go and run this file, you notice it runs the exact same way. And for such a small data set, the time difference, if any, is imperceptible to us. However, like I said, as you get into larger data sets, this can be a huge time saver and just a way to optimize our code in little bits of ways that's going to make our code run faster, which is very important if we're writing things like system software, which is what C++ was designed to do. So that's just a couple of ways that you can use for loops in addition. Oh. <clears throat> If we want to test additional conditional statements, we'll use our Boolean logic, such as our AND or OR operator, which we can specify in our for conditional section. In our variable modifier section, we can also modify other values. So for example, just as I put J++ here, I could do I++. While this is legal, it usually is not done because this can cause some logic errors. For example, something like this could wind up causing a problem with our loop 
because the I would always be incrementing and we would never get a chance to run our outer loop after we finish with our inner loop. However, one thing that we do see quite often is in our inner loop, instead of starting J always at the same value, in this instance of zero, we might set it to what our instance of I equals, or maybe some modification of I. For example, I plus one, because we want to get to the next value. Let's take a quick look at something like that. We're just going to select our zero and modify to say I plus one. Now when we run our file, if we scroll to the top, we'll see that J starts at one and then goes to nine. And then we print out that I was zero. In our next instance, I is going to be equal to one. And so J starts at two. And it once again goes until nine. And then J will start at three. And we can process this all the way down until we get to the end. We will see that J is starting at nine when I is equal to eight. I is going to be equal to nine, which is also its ending value. So it always modifies its code very quickly and easily. And it gives us a good way to kind of start with something like this. This is useful when we're using nested loops to test against arrays against other values inside the array and other instances of information like that. That's some ways that we can use a little bit more advanced functions within our for loop to provide some additional functionality outside the standard for loop that we often see.